Bibles and turn with me to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. We're going to be preaching nuggets for mom too. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm just uh, praying and thinking all week and just praying and uh, observing all week and uh, studying and reading whatever I can get my hands on to try to help with the subject, not trying to give you a Fancy outline, in-depth study. I just want it to be what it's entitled, Nuggets for Mom. I just want some little nuggets that will help you uh, be a better mom, be a better wife, just be a better person in general, amen? Uh, we all need some helps from time to time, and uh, here's a familiar verse uh, I'm going to take and kind of use to dive off into it tonight. Tw chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, mom, part of your job, part of your responsibility as mom is to train, to teach your children. And uh, part of that responsibility is uh, listed right here in verse 6. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. That don't mean stand back and tell a child how he should go, but you should be in the way. You train them by example. You should be in the way training them, not just commanding them to do what you're not doing. You're to train them in the way. I hope you understand what I'm saying there. You need to be in the way yourself. All right? Now, uh, Moms, I do want to help you. And I, I know your job is very demanding. Raising kids is not an easy job. If you're a stay-at-home mom, you're a, a single mom, you've got a very hard and demanding job. It is one that comes without a lot of appreciation. It comes without a lot of fanfare. It comes without a lot of appreciation. You don't get the pat on the back. You don't get the recognition that you truly deserve. In fact, a lot of times, uh, you're looked down upon. The world looks down on it, and the world sometimes mocks it and ridicules it. And I'm going to tell you why, ladies. I'm going to tell you why. If you're a stay-at-home mom or you're a mom that a single mom that's doing the best you can trying to raise kids by yourself without some deadbeat helping you, amen, and you're, you've got a job. You've got the hardest job that there is, the most the, the most demanding job that there is. Men can work eight hours and go home and leave their job. At eight hours, they're still wide open running through the living room. Amen. They just caught their second wind and they're not going down for a while. Amen. <laughs> it's not an easy job. And men, I'm going to save you some nights in the doghouse. Don't ever tell your wife that she's lucky or imply that she's lazy because she stays at home and raises the kids. I think before you do that, you ought to just check yourself, take a week off work, take your vacation time, and then let her go off and stay with her mom or stay somewhere else, and you do her job for a week. You run them little heathen that you sired around the house all day. You pick up after them. You wash and clean up everything they did. She's coming in at the same time you normally come in to check in on you. And she's going to do just like you do. She's going to come in and she's going to swoop in there and she's going to be a ball of energy. And she's going to rough and rowdy play in the house she's worked so hard and fussed at them kids all day to have clean. So when you got home, it'd be clean. You go in there and you mess it up with the kids for 20 minutes and then you're exhausted. It's her turn again. You're done. And you think, well, that ain't hard. No, it ain't because you got to lay on the sofa and relax. She went back to work again. She was taking care of them. She was watching them. She was listening out for them. So don't, 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 don't shoot yourself in the foot by opening your mouth and saying she's got it easy. Because it's not easy. Now back in 22 verse 6 there, it speaks of training your children. And mom, I, I do want to help you here because most of the child's training is going to come from you. 
I know man's head of the house, man's responsible for it, all that stuff, but the truth of the matter is, mm -hmm. everybody knows that most of the kids' training is coming from mom. Right. Mom is the one that's going <coughs> to teach them to, 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 to sit up. Mom's the one that's going to teach them to eat with a spoon. Mom's the one that's going to teach them to brush their teeth. Mom's the one that's going to train them when it comes time to potty train. Mom's the one that's going to teach them the ABCs and the one, two, threes and sing the nursery songs and the rhymes repeatedly over and over and over day after day till they're sickening because they still love it. Amen. If mom's the one that keeps doing that and she's training them. Dad's come in again in that 20 minute little spurts that he has. He does his rowdy thing. He messes up your house. He gets them wired and you finally got them settled down and now they're wired and ready to go. And you've got more cleaning to do. You've got more chasing to do. More toys to pick up after him and them. And on top of all that, the training that he does, you have to unlearn them. That's right. All the bad habits, you got to undo them. You say, what do you mean? Well, my wife used to say, my wife had to say it when my girls was little, teach them some sense. Because, <laughs> I mean, she'd be working with them all day and trying to teach them and get them to do stuff. And then I'd go in there and I'd just be saying all kinds of crazy stuff and just cutting up with them, playing around. And, oh, it just tired. Teach them some sense. Yeah. <laughs> but that's dads. That's the way we do. Mom's the one that takes care of a, a lot of the needs in the kid's life. Mom's the one that needs to be recognized. Mom, here's some nuggets for you. I'm just going to give you three, uh, and then we'll go to the house. First one, Mom, I want you to see is in Psalm 119. 119. <coughs> Longest chapter in the Bible. 119, look at verse 165. 119, verse 165. It's a familiar passage, but there's something in it that I want to pull out to give you, Mom, to try to help you help them. Okay? It says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. We're living in a sissified society today. I mean, men are in touch with their feminine side and feelings, and it, it, it's almost gross. It really is. It's just sickening how, 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 how pathetic society is now. Everybody's offended at everything. You can't say this now. You can't say that now. If you said something 20 years ago, they kicked you out. You can't ever hold an office. You can't ever run for anything. They, 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 they broke you off. They're so sensitive today. So here's what I want to tell you, Mom. Teach them some strength. Teach them to be strong. Mom, you're strong. You're a strong woman. God's entrusted you with children. God gave you a precious gift. He's entrusted them in your care. Teach them to be strong. You hear women talk about being strong all the time. Well, it's time to be strong. Amen? Be strong and teach them to be strong. Not to be offended at every little thing. The, today's society, everybody's offended by anything and everything. Uh, teach them not to be so thin-skinned. You know what I mean? Every little injury when, you're rich, when your skin is real thin, any little injury just bleeds. And it's like every little word or every little comment or every little forgot to call you back or forgot to text you or every little thing, you just bleed. And oh, it's a serious wound to some of them. Listen, the world's not always out to get you. Not everybody is trying to hurt you. And the kids need to realize that as well. Don't always assume the worst. Teach your kids not to always assume the worst. You know, one of the, one of the most drama-filled, I mean, drama-filled age groups is the teenage girls. I'm telling you, they are so full of drama. I know we've got some in here. Amen. Been doing some good to hear it. Listen. They are so full of drama. They take somebody and they stand there and wait. And they didn't text me back. 
She's mad at me. Well, I'm mad at her. She, she ghosts me. I'm a ghost her. I'm just going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell her what I think. And then finally, 20 minutes later, she finally got the email because something was going on in her life. She might have better things to do at that very moment than to sit there and talk to you. Her phone might have went dead. Her <laughs> mom or dad may have took her phone from her. You always assume the worst. And teenage girls is bad at it. But you know what? So is mom. So is dad. We always assume the worst without really thinking through a lot of times. So, sometimes they're not responding because they're busy. Did that ever occur to you? <laughs> I, uh, Roger, I was, talking to, I, was talking, I was talking to your dad. I was talking to my brother. I was talking to him and one time, and he said, Oh, I see you finally got your phone turned back on. I said, What do you mean? He said, Yeah, Roger said he tried to call you. He said he, he said he's going to... He probably knew I'd left my phone on silent. I'm bad to do that. I'll put it in my pocket after Sunday night and then Monday sometime I'll pull it out and I'll say, wait a minute, people have been trying to call me. Why didn't I hear it? Because I put it on silent. It wasn't I was avoiding you. I just forgot to put it back on ring. Amen? But some people I'm sure got offended. Don't teach your kids to be offended by everything. You say, well, how am I teaching my kids to be offended? By being offended every time something said to you. By being offended every time you felt like somebody disrespected you or slighted you. You need to teach your kids that some people are rude. Some people are not going to see things your way and do the thing, things the way you want them to be done. But you still need to be respectful. Teach them that the world is sometimes hard to get along with and it doesn't matter what they do. What matters is how you respond. It doesn't matter if somebody's rude to me. They may have had a bad day. They may have stuff going on in their life that I have no clue of. They may be hurting so deeply that, it, that it, I would do worse if I was in their shoes. So don't always assume it's about you. Maybe it's a bad day. Maybe they're having a terrible day. And their answer wasn't meant to be mean. It was just plain and to the point. Because they don't want to talk. Don't always assume you know what somebody's thinking. You will answer for your actions. Other people will answer for their actions. You can't control how other people talk to you. You can't control how other people treat you. But you can control the way you treat others and the way you speak to others. So teach them not to be so easily offended. I'm telling you, you somebody says something now and, and, and <coughs> next thing you know, they're ready to fight. Girls are fighting in schools now, just like men. I mean, they're fighting. I mean, they're throwing fists and, and they're fighting on the school buses and they're cussing each other out because they are thin-skinned and offended all the time. Mom, be an example. Just like Dad shouldn't have a chip on his shoulder and bark all the time, you shouldn't be so touchy and easily <coughs> hurt. Amen. That's good preaching if I am doing it. <coughs> the Lord told Joshua to be strong and of good courage because he knew what was in front of him was going to be a hard task. He was going into the promised land. He was facing battles and wars. Well, I'm telling you something. There's going to be battles and wars, parents, as you raise your children. There are going to be spiritual battles. There are going to be emotional battles. There are going to be hormonal battles. There are going to be all kinds of battles. Be strong and of good courage and teach them to be strong the same. If you keep going around and letting everything hurt your feelings, I'll tell you what it's going to be. <coughs> Hurt feelings, not taken care of, and being offended easily will lead you to be angry. And anger will lead to bitterness. And bitterness to hatred. And, and, and then you'll start suffering loss. Why? Because you'll be so snappy and so mean and so, so ill and miserable all the time. You push friends away. You push family away. Because everybody hurts your feelings. I don't want to talk to you. That's what's going on in a lot of homes. And mom, you're teaching your children by example. Remember, you're the one who's walking in the way you should be training them. They're going to do what you do. Our prayer, 
I shouldn't say our because I'm not a woman or a mama, but your prayer, mom, should be, oh, Lord, help me not to be so easily offended. And I'll say this too, man. Some of you men are too easily offended. I remember working, man, I worked with a bunch of guys, and we didn't talk nice to each other. Everybody in there was stupid and ugly and had a terrible nickname. Amen. And that's because they liked you. When they was mad at you, it got bad. <laughs> Amen. It, 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 <clears throat> nowadays, people you can't take a joke. They can't take anything. You, you just try to try to have a little bit of humor. My daughters are tougher than a lot of men today. I mean, just growing up the way I would talk to them sometimes. Now they understood when when I was picking on them. They understood the difference between when Daddy was serious and Daddy was joking. But daddy could pick on them, and there's some grown men, if I try to pick on them, would get so offended that they couldn't stand it because the preacher insulted me. I said, worse to my daughter, I guarantee you. And they didn't get offended. You say, preacher, no, I'm trying to help you. Because today, everybody runs around like a victim. They're victims. According to the Bible, I've read it, we're victors in Christ, not victims in Christ. We shouldn't run around, oh, woe's me, I'm the victim. I, and Molly grew up and pout. We should have joy. We're on the winning side. Amen. <coughs> not have a life full of misery and bitterness because we are so easily offended at everything. Don't be so easily offended. Teach your kids to be strong. Now, men, I'm going to help you out. You better not leave me hanging out to dry here. Mom, men don't talk like girls. Men do not talk like girls. Our thinking process is totally different than yours. I mean, we do not think the same. I mean, when something goes bad, there's a bad wreck, and we think, man, they just bought that truck. And your first thought is, I wonder if everybody's okay. No. <laughs> how many men, how many men know what I'm talking about? Amen. You, you just assume they're all right. You, your first thought is, man, that was a nice truck you just wrecked. <laughs> Amen. That's just, men think different. Men think different. Now, that was a crude example, but you know what I'm saying. Men think different. <coughs> Sometimes, ladies, you'll misread your own husband. Sometimes you will misread plain speech for mean speech. You'll think he meant to hurt you when he was just being plain. He was just saying it like he would say it to anybody else at work. He's worked all day. He's been around men all day. And when he comes home, you ask him a question. He just answers it straight blank. And you think, well, what's your problem? What did I do to you? What are you mad about? And, and we're standing there, what's wrong with her? What did I do now? <laughs> and two hours later, you still ain't figured it out, and she's still mad. <laughs> Why? She misread it. She misread it. And that happens a lot. Why? Because we're too easily offended. Ladies, I'm going to say something here, and, and I don't want you to get mad. I want you to know I'm helping you, but some of you just need to get over it. Amen. Men have been talking like men since men came on the scene. And you know what? If you want a man, you're going to get a man. If you want a sissy, go get a sissy. Amen. Now, there's been times, there's been times. Now, I love my wife to death, and I shouldn't, I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't, and I'm not going to embarrass my wife. This is on me. This is on me. There's been times we'd be working together or something and I'd say something to her, I don't know, maybe we are bleeding brakes. She's up in the car, I've raised her up in the car and I'm underneath the car and I'll say, mash the pedal. And she'll, and she'll say, what? I'll say, mash the pedal! So she can hear me. What are you hollering at me for? <laughs> I can't win! What do, you, what do you want to start a fuss for? I'm not! Well, what are you hollering at me? You don't talk to your wife like... Amen. How many of you men say amen right there? You've been there. Amen. amen. All right. How many of you ladies now you understand? Still don't. See, I told you. I told you. We don't make nothing alike. Amen. And we don't talk to each other alike. A lot of times 
We just say things plain and to the point. We don't need a half an hour conversation. We want to get this thing done, so move to the left. Or, or, or help me set this over here. Amen. And, well, you could have said it nicer. Would that have made you hurry? It wouldn't have done it any quicker. You say, preacher, that's terrible. I'm looking at the mean grinning from ear to ear. They say, yes, preacher, yes, finally. Somebody gets it. Because yeah, I'm a man. If it was a woman doing this, it would be a total different story. Amen? My wife has told me this over the years. You need to talk to me, better man. I say, honey, I've been talking to you this way for 35 years. Well, you need to change. I ain't changed yet. Probably ain't going to. You need to learn. <laughs> you need to figure it out. Hey, but see, there's another two, three day conversation you may have. <laughs> Amen. And, and you're never going to resolve it. Why? Because men are men and women are women. Right. And both can be offended very easily. Some men get offended because the wife may say something that he misunderstands. She's attacked his pride. She's, she's made me, oh, what, what do you mean? I'm good to you. I don't do that. I don't talk bad to you. Are you saying I'm a bad husband? Are you implying I'm a bad dad? We can be just as a fool <coughs> and our kids is watching us. We need to learn not to be so easily offended, especially with the person you love, especially in the home in front of the kids. Learn to let it go. Get over it. And just realize we're different. We're going to speak different from time to time. We got something else going on in our heads. Amen. And I've learned this. Don't ask us to explain. It don't help. <laughs> Amen. It don't help. Because if we try to explain it, it just prolongs it or starts the fuss. Amen. Number two. Boy, I left you confused on that one, didn't I? Don't be so easily offended. Number two. Teach them selflessness. Teach them selflessness. Now, we have a bunch of selfish people today. Uh, Philippians. Turn over to Philippians. And look at this. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4. In Philippians 2 and verse 4, <coughs> listen to what the Bible says. Look not every... Well, let's start in verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man to his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Teach your kids to be selfless rather than selfish. We've got too many selfish people today. Uh, in our society, and a lot of it is come from what the way they were raised. The way they were raised. How many of you remember this? Mom and Dad go into the store and they'd leave one of you in charge. Look after your brother. Look after your sister. How many of you remember being told that? Amen. There's a few members of that. That, that. That's looking after somebody else. That's let you, you realized you was responsible for somebody else. Now, I will say this. Now, Mom's Get this, dads pay attention because you, you need to agree with this. There's no one, uh, there is no better example of selflessness than the Lord Jesus Christ. He sacrificed all to save us. He left glory where he was worshipped. They sang his praises 24-7. He came down here, took on this wicked flesh, walked 33 and a half years without sin and went up Calvary's hill and willingly laid down his life for us. That is the ultimate sacrifice. The ultimate example of selflessness. And right under the Lord is mom's. Right under the Lord's would be mom. Mom is the most selfless person in the world. Moms that are selfish aren't good moms. Moms that are selfish aren't good examples. But a mom that is selfless will put her children before herself, will, will take care of her child's needs before her own. Uh, they, will, they will do without so their kids can have the last piece of pie 
They'll save for the kid. They'll buy the kid new shoes when they need new shoes. They will buy for the kids new clothes at school so that they can have something nice to wear to school when they themselves are wearing old clothes that needs to be replaced. Moms are selfless. And kids may not appreciate it when they're young. They may not say thank you when they get a little older. But when they get kids of their own and they begin having to pay those same prices and they think back to their childhood, they should remember and they'll appreciate it then. They'll know what you've done then. Three things about that. Teach them by example again. Teach them by example. By being selfless. Not only with, with them, but with family. Many times I know that my wife has uh, not felt good and still cooked me a meal or not felt good and still cleaned or done something for me. Many times she may have wanted that last helping of whatever was in there and she'd give it to me. Many times I've seen her do it for the kids. Very selfless in her actions. Your actions speak loudly to your children. Your children love you and they will emulate you. They will try to be like what you are. By example, teach them to be selfless, but also with encouragement. You're, you being selfless not only encourages them, but you should purposely <coughs> encourage them. Purposely tell them and teach them to share their toys. No, that's my toy. That's mine. Well, you hit no, sh 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 <coughs> look, 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 Johnny, you share now. No, that's mine, man, mine. Why? Because naturally, children are selfish. It's my toy. It's mine. No, I'm telling you, they'd kill you if they was big enough. Because have you ever seen that? Have you ever felt that death grip on the toy? <laughs> You try to pull it out of his hand and his head's turning red. You can see the fingertips is white. They are, they are gripping with all they got. You ain't getting this toy. I mean, you about pick the kid up. <laughs> try to get that kid off of there. <laughs> it's mine. You ain't have it. Teach them to be selfless. Moms do that. Moms are selfless with their church family, with their family, with neighbors, with co-workers, and sometimes even strangers. They're selfless. And teach them to be the same. Teach them to share. Teach them, if the Lord's blessed you, you should bless others. The Lord blessed you that you might bless others. <coughs> That's what you're teaching them. And you ought, to be, you, ought to, you ought to teach them to be selfless with excitement. You say, what do you mean with excitement? Praise them when they do. Praise them when they, when, when, when they share that toy, when they, when they go out of their way and give something to someone else. You say, well, I bought that for them. They shouldn't have done it. Listen, let it go. What you've taught them is worth a lot more than whatever they gave away. If they get it. Selflessness <coughs> is an important lesson. Today, people are so selfish. It is not even funny. Old timers used to call it just good old hospitality. You used to go visit with somebody and they say, oh, come on in, come on in, come on in. It's hot out there or it's cold out there. Nowadays, they're just leave you standing on the porch in the rain, dog chewing on your leg. <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't matter anymore. It used to be that people would invite you in and, oh, come in, have, have you said, you want something to drink? You want something to drink? You sure? We, now we got, we, now my wife had some chicken. We got some left over. It's still warm. You want some chicken? Try to get them some. They, they'd spend so much time you couldn't tell them, listen, my car broke down. I just need to get a bar of foam. <laughs> you, you spend a half hour of them trying to feed you and fatten you up and uh, make sure you ain't thirsty and you're comfortable. That's just good old hospitality. You don't see a whole lot of that nowadays, do you? <coughs> Angie's mom. Angie's mom is a perfect example. Still to this day, we go there and visit her. We go in and it's always, come on in, come on in, sit down or something like that. And she's always 
You want spaghetti? I got spaghetti in there. I got some chicken in there. You want some of this? I, I got something in the fridge. I can get it out for Always trying to feed everybody that comes to our house. Always trying to feed somebody's house. Take care of everybody. And I've watched, and you know what Angie does? Same thing. We're empty nesters. There's just two of us. She'll get out the big old crock pot and she'll put in a big old piece of meat in there and she'll be cooking and I'm thinking, there's no way I'm going to be able to eat all that. <laughs> but see, I ain't the one she's thinking about all the time. She knows that that Amanda and Justin likes that pork roast. And she'll, she'll cook up, and she'll take off a section for me for a couple of days, and then she'll take the rest of it, and she'll put it in a, in a some kind of cup, well, I don't know what you call that thing. She'll put it in a box, uh, how about that? She'll put it in a box, wrap it duct tape, I don't care what she does with it. But anyway, she'll take it and she'll bring it to them. Or a lot of times she'll be cooking there and it, it, she knows that one of the girls is coming over there and she makes sure there's food that they like. And she's always asking them, you want me to make you something? You want me to make you something? She's always asking, what do you want for supper? What do you want for supper? If you come by, you want to eat? I'll make you something. I'll have something. And it's, what, where does she get that? She got it from mom. She may not realize it, but that comes from mom. Mom taught her. Amen. Moms that are selfless teach their kids to be the same. Still to this day, I don't know if anybody's noticed, I've been here 10 years. When I come in here, I remember the first church dinner that you had. First church dinner that you had, they said, Preacher, y'all go first. And I felt so out of place and so wrong going first because I was taught that you always wait and make sure everybody else has got something. And if you watch, my wife and I is usually one of the last ones that goes through the line. Why do I do that? Because we're inviting people in and I want to make sure that they get what they want before I go through. Make sure everybody else got something. That's just being selfless with the little things. But boy, I tell you what, you go out now, you go out in the stores, man, they're killing you. <laughs> They ain't but one Tickle Me Elmo and they gonna have it, amen. They ain't but one Blue Light or, or Sale Light or Kmart. Is Kmart even still open? I don't think it's gone now. Ain't. Whatever, you know what I'm saying though. Like getting between a woman and a shoe sale. Don't hunt, don't do it, don't try it. You, you come out of that hurt, amen. But anyway, teach them to be selfless because naturally they are. And I will say this, Mom, if your kids are going to get it, they're going to get it from you because men, for some reason, we are generally more selfish than women. That's just being a fact. We just are. I don't know just whether we just didn't grow up. Uh, we still think ourselves to be kids. I still don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up. And I'm 53. Amen. <laughs> you said, preacher, that's horrible, that's terrible. Hey, in my, in my mind, Angie, she says, Angie, oh, I can get her going. I can get her going. She really believes that I think I'm 20 sometimes. <laughs> Amen. 16, I use 16. I use 16 for years. I've moved it up to 20 now. <coughs> Amen. Why? Because in my head, I still feel 20. Amen. And my body tells me different. <laughs> but my head still thinks I'm 20. But anyway, let's give you this last one we go to the house. Ladies, mom, teach them to keep swinging. Teach your children to keep swinging. I know it don't make any sense. Uh, a verse came to mind, uh, uh, and I'll give it to you in a minute, but let me share with you the story that that, that point come from. I read a story about a mom who was embarrassed. She had a, 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 a young teenage son that wanted to play baseball. He wanted to play baseball. He had watched them pitchers pitch. He had watched them batters hit. And they went, they got the glove and got the bat. He was so excited. Tryouts was in a couple weeks. And he said, Mom, <coughs> take me to the batting cage. They told me at school that some people was going to be at the batting cage. So she took him to the batting cage thinking it was just going to be nothing. You know, just some kids out there in the batting cage playing ball. But no, the coach was there. And the team from last year was there. And she didn't realize that ball came in there so fast. They had the pitching machine for the baseball players. 
and that ball was whipping in through there and, and, and they, she, she forgot to bring his helmet and they gave him a helmet to wear and everything when he got in there and he got up there and here comes a pitch and a swing, nothing but air. Here comes a second pitch and a swing, nothing but air. 20 pitches in a row before they ask him to step aside and let some other kid come up. He didn't hit a thing. She was horrified. She was humiliated. Her, her heart was breaking, thinking that he would be embarrassed in front of his friends because he had missed the ball so many times. And he got in the car and he was so excited. That was so much fun. He enjoyed that. He enjoyed it. He would have loved it if he had hit the ball. But he had a good time anyway. He still had a good attitude. He was still excited. And she said to him, well, I don't think that's your, yours. I, I, don't, I don't know if that's, that's, that's going to be a fit for you. But I tell you what we can do. We can find what you're good at. We'll help you find what you're good at. We'll do that for you. You know what she just did? She just tore him down. He still had a good attitude. He wasn't embarrassed. She was because all those other parents and those other kids were hitting the ball. They had played ball before. It was a ball team from last year. They had played ball. He just now got interested in it. He, he, he didn't know anything. <coughs> and when he went home and, and she talked to her husband and told him about it and what she had said, he said, he went in there and he said, boy, when's the back cage closed? He said, I don't know. He said, well, get in the car. Dad took him down there and gave him a few pointers and he swung and he missed. And he swung and he missed. And he swung and there was a pop-up. He swung and there's one that hit the dirt. And he swung and he was just getting chips and it was chips of the ball was flying behind him. But the first time he got that timing down and he come around there and he cracked that bat and that ball flew out and hit the net at the back, that boy came alive. And he began to hit the ball. He, all he needed was some pointers and some encouragement. But what mom had done is worry about his feelings. Oh, he's going to be horrified. His friends saw him miss. Well, I'll make it easy for him to quit. I'll tell him we'll find something else. I like the dad. The dad took him down there and said, boy, you keep swinging. Keep swinging. Mom was saying, oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's not for everybody. We'll find what, you, what you're good at. It, it may not be for everybody. It may not be your thing. What are you raising? A quitter or someone who will keep swinging? Teach them to keep swinging. Now, Mom, I know you know your kids <coughs> better than anybody. And Mom... You, what you ought to do, you ought to try to help them find the talent that God's given them. Help them find God's will for their life and encourage them to get in it. Help them find what they love to do, what they desire to do. Because God's going to put a desire in them. God's going to give them a gift. God's going to put that desire in there for them. And then encourage them in that. Even if they ain't good when they first start. Who is? Amen. How many of you have ever swung at, swung at a ball and missed it? Amen. I hadn't swung the ball so long, I'd probably miss it. <coughs> Amen. Just being honest with you. I used to like to hit left-handed. I'm right-handed, but I can get up there left-handed. Why? I could hit it further. Don't ask me why. It was the dumbest thing I ever seen, too. But I could hit further left-handed. I could control it. I could control it. I'd, I'd pull that thing down either line I wanted to when I was playing. But listen, teach them to keep swinging. I, I, and the verse that I thought of when I was thinking about this, it, it came in my mind and I kind of liked it myself, was in Ephesians 6. Having done all to stand, stand. You say, wait a minute, you're telling them to keep swinging. Yeah, but if he can't hit it, tell them just stand there. Sooner or later, they'll walk in and get on base. <laughs> Amen. You say, preacher, that's horrible, that's terrible. Teach them not to give up. Just because you're embarrassed. <coughs> Just because you don't think his feelings can handle it. Moms, you be overprotective with your kids and you're going you're gonna to make a mess. 
You're going to raise a quitter that will quit on his family, that will quit on his marriage, that will quit on his kids, that will quit on everything, even life. We're not raising quitters. We're raising, we're raising kids that will stick to it. So, Mom, here it is again. Some nuggets for you. Don't raise crybabies. Teach them to be tough. Teach them some strength. Mom, don't raise a bunch of selfish brats. Teach them to be selfless. And mom, don't raise quitters. Teach them to keep swinging. Nuggets for mom. I'm actually bow your heads. Close your eyes. While heads is bowed and eyes is closed.